Hi everyone, Darren from iLayer. Recently, while looking into optic fibre and lasers, I got interested in the electromagnetic spectrum. Part of what I found fascinating is that there's so much of it that's completely invisible to our eyes, yet it's also completely necessary to our survival. And without it, we wouldn't have much in the way of technology at all. It's the magic behind electricity, electronics, ethernet, optic fibre, Wi-Fi, radio and TV. Electromagnetic radiation warms the earth, it allows us to see colours, it lets doctors see inside our bodies without surgery, but it can also be dangerous. It's the dangerous part I find interesting as well. Can mobile phones really give you cancer? Is your Wi-Fi router slowly cooking your brain and turning you into a zombie while you sleep? Do lasers make you go blind if you look directly at them? Some people say yes, some say no way. Let's have a scientific look at what we do know. So to start with, we need to understand that radiation just means the method that electromagnetic waves travel through space. It doesn't necessarily mean something nuclear or dangerous. Waves radiate at different rates, which we call frequencies, and we categorise them by those rates on a scale known as the electromagnetic spectrum. Wave frequency is the number of wave cycles within a period of time. A wave cycle includes both the crest and the trough. One wave cycle in one second we call one hertz, named after German physicist Heinrich Hertz, who made important scientific contributions to the study of electromagnetism. If we have a thousand cycles in a second, we call it a kilohertz, a million is a megahertz, and 1000 million is a gigahertz, and so on. Wavelength, that's the distance from crest to crest or trough to trough, and wave frequency are also closely tied together. Obviously, if we're going to squish more waves into a single second, they're going to end up closer together, and so we get shorter wavelengths with higher frequencies. If we put more power into the wave, we get a bigger wave, which means an increase in wave height, which we call amplitude. The higher frequency waves in the electromagnetic spectrum are also higher energy, and the greater the frequency, the more energy it needs. At the high frequency end of the electromagnetic spectrum, we start with gamma rays. These have wavelengths that are so close together, we measure them at an atomic level. Next comes X-rays, then ultraviolet, commonly shortened to just UV light. Then we have a tiny slot in the spectrum we call visible light. This is the only part of the electromagnetic spectrum we can observe with our eyes. Below that we have infrared rays, which are responsible for warming the Earth from the Sun, and we also use it artificially for remote controls and the lasers we use in optic fibre cables. Then we get into radio waves. These include radar, TV, FM and AM radio waves, which can have wavelengths of millimetres at the radar end, up to hundreds of metres long as we get to the end of the scale. Near the start of radio waves is the super high frequency range, which is where our 5 GHz Wi-Fi falls with a wavelength of 6 centimetres. Then we have UHF or ultra high frequency, which is where our 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi frequency falls with a wavelength twice as long at 12.5 centimetres. Then we have VHF or very high frequency, which is where our 4G Wi-Fi and digital TV signals fall. These can have wavelengths anything from 1 meter to 10 meters. This is also the frequency range we use for the electrical signals to transmit data over ethernet cables. Then we get to LF or low frequency like 240 volt electricity, which is 50 to 60 hertz depending on the country in question. Now we're talking wavelengths of 6 kilometers or more, but remember we're still talking 50 to 60 to waves every second, which is still a massive number. Just below that is where human brain waves fall, which is between half a hertz, which is one wave every two seconds, during deep sleep, and 30 hertz when we're fully awake. That's wavelengths between 10,000 and 600,000 kilometers long, would you believe? Okay, that's really cool, but when does it get dangerous? We can divide electromagnetic waves into two categories, ionizing rays and non-ionizing rays. From gamma rays up to part of the UV spectrum, we have ionizing rays. What that means is that they can transfer their energy to atoms and change their structure by splitting off electrons and in some cases even destroy the nucleus of an atom completely. That may sound nasty, but because these waves travel through solid objects really well, we can also do some really cool things with them, like x-raying our bodies or killing cancer cells with radiation therapy. Three factors affect just how dangerous ionizing waves can be. That's the intensity or power of the wave, the duration or length of time we're exposed to it, and how far away we are from it. Power tends to drop off with distance and what media it has to travel through to get to us. Some waves like gamma rays will travel through pretty much anything. Other waves can be stopped by materials like some metals like lead or water, glass or even our skin. 
That's why the radiographer leaves the room when you get an x-ray and they cover parts of your body they don't want exposed to the x-rays with lead sheets. Any electromagnetic waves above that we call non-ionizing, which means they don't have the ability to change atoms, but they can excite atoms enough to create heat. This is how microwave ovens work. Again, while technically these wave frequencies don't change atoms to interfere with the DNA structure in our cells to cause cancer as such, they can still be dangerous if we go back to the same factors of power of the wave, duration or length of exposure, and the level of shielding we have from it. Power can be changed in one of two ways. We can put more energy into it. As an example, my torch here has been modified to pump out nearly 20 times more light than the standard mag light bulb that came with it from the factory. That's about the same brightness as a car's high beam. We do that by drawing more energy from the battery. With the standard bulb, I'd get several weeks of use out of the batteries. With this one, I now only get a couple of hours. Is it dangerous to look at now though? No, not really. While it's super bright, the light spreads out quickly once it leaves the bulb, so even at a fairly close range, it won't cause permanent damage if you look directly at it. It will cause temporary blindness for several minutes though if you copped it straight into the face without any warning in the dark which is why police and security guards tend to do that to you. It's a bit hard to attack someone if you can't see them clearly. <laughs> the second way we can increase power is by taking the energy over a large area and focusing it into a small area. For example, this laser pointer. Now it can cause permanent eye damage, even though we're not putting anyone near as much energy into it as we were with the torch. What makes it dangerous is the crystal inside has taken the energy that would have been spread out over a large area and focused it onto a small point. Neither of them are ever going to burn my skin though, no matter how long I stay under them. Not enough power. We can demonstrate this further with a magnifying glass in the sun. So what we're going to do here is take the sun's energy spread out over a large area and focus it on a small point. Again, duration is a factor. Notice it doesn't start burning straight away. Or if I move the paper around, it won't start burning at all. If I move the paper away, it stays safe. Or if I put something metal in between the magnifying glass and the paper, it all stays perfectly safe. Or no magnifying glass at all, perfectly safe. But if I stand here long enough, I might get a sunburn. Interesting to note here as well that this magnifying glass is only five times magnification. I have one here that's ten times magnification, but it's really hard to start a fire with it. If I stood here long enough and I could hold this paper and magnifying glass still enough, I might get something happening. But why isn't the stronger magnifying glass able to make a fire faster? The reason for that is, with this one we only have a really small surface area to capture energy from. So we only got about 10 mils of sunlight going into that. Whereas this one we've got about 100 mils of sunlight going into it. Going back to our microwave, you might be aware that microwave ovens use microwaves in the 2.4 GHz frequency, which is the same frequency used by most of our Wi-Fi routers, baby monitors, cordless phones, remote control toys and lots of other stuff. Does that mean our routers could be slowly cooking us? No. Again, it comes down to the amount of power we pump into it and our length of exposure to a lesser extent. Microwave ovens are also usually operating at 700 to 1000 watts, while the average router pumps out just 1 to 200 milliwatts. Plus we tend to move around constantly, and the oven concentrates its energy on a single point, while the router is spreading the waves out all over the place. Most routers come with fairly low gain antennas. Gain, when talking about antennas, is the characteristics of the antenna as a relationship to a theoretical isotropic 0 dBi antenna which has an equal broadcast of 360 degrees in all direction. dBi stands for decibels isotropic. The numbers go up, the higher the gain. Most routers have around 2 to 2.5 dBi gain antennas like this one, which is a great all-round antenna. As we go up into 5 or 7 dBi antennas, we're not pumping out any more power as such. What we're doing is taking that spread out energy and focusing it into a smaller area. In this case, so we get less vertical coverage and more horizontal instead. A bit like sitting on a balloon. There's other magic we can do to focus an antenna in a single direction, which is great when you want to create a Wi-Fi link between two buildings, for example. Changing gain up to about 7 dBi and pushing 100 to 200 milliwatts through it isn't likely to be dangerous, 
Put 1.21 gigawatts into it though, and you could break space time. I once had the privilege of installing a building to building Wi-Fi link and we had to install the antennas on the roof of two inner city medium height buildings. The roofs on both buildings were already shared with lots of microwave and mobile phone antennas with some decent power pumping through them. I was interested to see areas were marked out with painted lines and guardrails to show where it was safe to walk on the roof. Stepping outside of those areas meant you could suffer serious RF burns provided the antennas were transmitting at the time. Remember, these microwave antennas are designed to focus energy into a single area with a heap of power behind it for a point-to-point -point transmission over a long distance. So stepping in front of one could be just as catastrophic as stepping into a microwave oven. Can your home router hurt you though? That's seriously unlikely, but take that same 2.4 GHz radiation, focus it into a single point and pump enough power into it, and you could have yourself a fairly serious weapon if your bad guys are close enough to you and you can get them to stand still long enough. The same thing could be said for any other electromagnetic frequency though, even visible light. Bearing in mind we're constantly walking around in all sorts of radiation from both artificial sources like radio and TV signals, microwave and satellite communication signals and natural sources like the light from the sun. A lot of these are packing a lot more punch than our Wi-Fi and mobile phones and nobody's getting hurt unless we crank up the power and expose ourselves to it directly for too long. There is a fairly recent condition called Wi-Fi Sensitivity or EHS which stands for Electromagnetic Hypersensitivity Syndrome. The symptoms like nausea, headaches, rashes, panic attacks and confusion are very real but the actual cause is yet to be determined. No relationship to electromagnetic waves has yet been proven, with the World Health Organization concluding that there's no known medical, psychiatric or psychological cause for the syndrome. One example of VHS in popular fiction is the TV show Better Call Saul. The central character Jimmy had a brother called Chuck who suffered from EHS. Chuck eventually had to leave his law practice due to the condition and then spent his life with his head under a space blanket after gutting his house of all wiring and refusing to let anyone come near him with a mobile phone or any other electronic device. It was proven on a couple of occasions in the show that his illness was psychosomatic by concealing mobile phones in the room he was in or planting electronic devices in his clothes without his knowledge. One theory to the cause of EHS is that people are reacting to visible factors like the flickering of fluoro lights or computer monitors which trigger psychosomatic symptoms. Is it real though? Well the syndrome and the symptoms are very real but the jury's still out on the actual cause. UV light is an example of invisible electromagnetic waves that can and do hurt us and even cause cancer. UV is commonly split into three groups, UVA, UVB and UVC. UVC light or far UV has the shortest wavelength and is ionising and therefore the most dangerous form of all UV light but thankfully can't penetrate our ozone layer. UVB or middle UV isn't quite as dangerous but still has some ionising waves. It doesn't penetrate much below skin level though but that's far enough to cause skin cancers. Again though it depends on the intensity of the exposure so maybe rethink tanning beds, the duration of the exposure, don't lie around in the sun for too long and shielding, cover up and wear sunscreen. UVA or near UV light is non-ionizing radiation so technically shouldn't cause cancer but it can cause premature aging and wrinkles depending on the exposure and duration etc etc. There is evidence that it can cause skin cancer sometimes but again we're tending to look at circumstances involving chronic and or repeated exposure over a long period of time. It's possible that our cells may stop repairing themselves or repair themselves incorrectly if we do that to them too often. Lasers used in optical fibre are also interesting. These fall into the lower end of the infrared spectrum, just outside of what we can see. Lasers used in multi-mode optic fibre over short distances are typically relatively low powered and have wavelengths between 850 and 1300 nanometers, which is under 1 1,000th of a millimetre. Single mode lasers designed for long distances are typically 1310 to 1550 nanometers and may also have quite a bit of power pumping into them. Once again, the power and duration of exposure are the only ways these can hurt you. Problems arise here though when looking directly into an optic fiber or the open optical port of a fiber module. The light coming out of them is outside our visible range so we won't be able to see it and it won't trigger a blink response so we could suffer a long exposure without realizing we're even looking at anything. 
using an inspection microscope to look at the end of a fibre while terminating it is a double whammy if the fibre is live. Now we're also increasing the intensity of the light and we still can't see it. With that being said though, most lasers using optical fibre also have a secondary light within the visible spectrum built into it for exactly this reason, so we can see it's live just by looking at it. Failing that, always check a fibre with a power meter before staring at it, especially through a microscope. So that's a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum. There are whole branches of science including physics and astrophysics which looks at the light coming from stars to determine what they're made of amongst many other things using what we know about the electromagnetic spectrum. It's the magic behind most of the gadgets we use in our everyday lives. It's the technology we use to communicate and use the internet. It warms the earth and fills it with colour. Without it we wouldn't even exist and yet it can also be dangerous if we increase its power and stand in front of it for too long without any protection. If you enjoyed this video please give it a like below and don't forget to subscribe and give the little bell a click if you'd like a notification of any new videos as they go up. Please check out our webpage at www.dintech.com.au and if you need any more information please comment below or send us an email to sales at dintech.com.au. Don't forget our national workshop invitation. If you're interested in coming along to a workshop to learn a little bit more about the cabling industry and have a play with some tools terminating UTP and optic fibre, please send us an email to let us know. Thanks and bye for now.